I'm Nathan Gunn, and this is Living the Classical Life. I perform a lot, and, and, and uh, we sing a lot more performances than they used to 50 years ago. You know, we do, gosh, I mean, not including the free ones, like the dress rehearsals where they have with invited audiences, 60 probably performances a year. And sometimes, you know, you're just maybe tired, or you're just not into it, or you're, you're thinking, I don't know if I... Whatever it is, everybody has different days where they, they think, okay, I'm going to go to work, but I'm kind of exhausted, you know. But some, some of those days where I think, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, I think about the audience, and I think about how much money they're spending for that ticket, <laughs> and I'm thinking that, about the fact that they're coming to the show, and they want to see it, and it's up to me to make it, as well as my colleagues, to make it, to make it good to actually tell them a story that will hopefully change their lives in, 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 in some way. And that's what gets me going. I mean, if I don't think about the audience, I just don't, I, I'm not interested. I think singers more than any other instrument have to know about pacing themselves. How do you decide when too much is too much? How do yeah. you take care of your instrument? Yeah. Well, everybody's a little bit different. I, um, <laughs> I, you know, I could get in arguments about this with women because I always feel like they sing in their head voice and we sing in our speaking voice, so it's harder for us. And you know, it's, you know whatever. Um, I think about vocal technique a lot. Hmm. You, you have to make sure that you don't push, you don't hurt yourself, and if you can sing so that you don't hurt yourself and you sing in a healthy way, which I call to my students sustained talking, basically, hmm. um, you're more expressive and you keep uh, excellent vocal health. Um, the f traveling is sometimes tough because everybody gets sick when they get off planes. And, and if you get sick, it means you can't sing. And then if you, if you, or if you sing when you're sick, that's a problem. I try not to do that, although I'm rarely ill, so that's good. Everybody's a little bit different. I, I rarely cancel, so mm -hmm. uh, I try to kind of, I guess the best, best way to describe it is I have, I have a very healthy disrespect for what I do, and that <laughs> keeps my brain in line so that I don't get freaked out. I think one of the exciting things about the world of stage, for me, is mm -hmm. that anything can happen. Yeah, it's like sports. It's like watching a football game. You have no idea how it's gonna end. What's one of the strangest things that happened to you on stage? Strangest? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Stra well, the, the last time I was, uh, I won't say what company it was, I got hit in the head <laughs> with a, a, by a, a fly that was coming down that nobody told me about with a metal bar and it gave me a concussion where I was completely like loopy for the end of the show. Oh my. There was another place where, I mean the weird things that happen on stage are usually, you know, this is another place where a sandbag wasn't, that's supposed to 200 pounds, wasn't hooked up properly, and I, it missed me by that. I mean, I felt the air go by. <laughs> the stage is a very <laughs> dangerous place. And yeah, that, that was sort of, boy, this, the, head, the head of those guys was screaming. His, he was just going bananas when that happened, as he should have, because people, somebody could have gotten killed. Um, Conversely, what would you say would be some of the moments on stage that surprised you with the magic? That happens frequently with Julie in recital. When you're doing opera, it's, there are a lot more variants. You know, you've got the orchestra, and you've got the conductor, and you've got the lights, and you've got the costumes, and the, 
you know, and everything. But there have been some moments that where you feel like you finally have really connected to an audience. The soliloquy that I did um, in Billy Budd at the Met last year, year before last, where I finally got it. You know, I was like, I've been doing that role for a long time, trying to find something that I'd been missing over and over, and I, fi and I finally got it. That was a moment that was really sort of special for me. And um, Mandy Patinkin, where we do our show, and it's just absolute now. I don't know how else to describe it, but you're just in the now, and you're doing your thing, and your, your audience is there, and he's there, and I'm there, and we're just like, you know, uh, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of, uh, it's different than the finding that Britain thing that you were looking for, searching throughout it to get it. This is like a connectivity between, you know, him and me and Julie and, you know, and Paul, and it's just like, it's the perfect kind of human connection where, and those things, ha you know, that's, I think that's what, maybe why we do it. That's, you know, it's a, that's why we risk all the public humiliation possibilities. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, yeah. To find that yeah. zone where that magic happens, is that a conscious process? I mean, when you're on stage, you always project a certain inner calm. Yeah, well, I mean, there's never, I mean, the, 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 you know, it's like a duck on, a, on, the, on the pond, you know, the feet, you know, the feet are going like this <laughs> underneath. Um, it's a lot of practice. You practice, 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 practice. Mm -hmm. You work, 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 work. And then the, um, there might seem to be an inner calm, but um, it, it, it's mostly about, for me, breaking down barriers. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting to the audience. So the, the Billy Budd recording that I did, I fought tooth and nail to get them to not, you know, to not force all of us to wear white tie and tails. I, and, and I won eventually. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because it was the first time I realized that the audience coming to see us. So all the, the, the basically what happened was the, uh, the officers were in white tie and tails. And then the slightly lower, you know, whatever they are, were in black tie. And then everybody else, the seamen, were all like in a black sweater and in pants or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the audience's reaction to seeing us in clothing that they were wearing mm -hmm. was very different. It, it was like they were more open to it. And I thought, huh, maybe this is something to think about. And because the point is to communicate with other people. There's no point to any of the things that we do if you're not actually reaching people. And, and that sometimes is part of it. If you put on your, you know, the, or, it used to be that when people go see the orchestra, the CSO or the, you know, LSO or whatever it is, they would wear white tie and tails. Hmm. We don't do that anymore. So why should they? They used to be dressed like the people in the audience, right? But now they're not. And that creates a, a barrier for whatever reason that, um, that is not helpful for us uh, when it comes to communicating through music. Do you feel like it would be better if the concert halls got rid of a certain amount of formality. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, you know, it was never quite like, it's not like what it was now. I mean, the mm -hmm. overtures were there with a big, you know, you know, dominant chords at the end of it so that people know to shut up and sit down. Mm -hmm. They had uh, arias that were called uh, gelato aria or something like that, <laughs> where people would go out and get ice cream, you know, or something while the minor characters sang the aria. I mean. It, it was, it was a, it, people behaved like it was an, like they normally do. Today, I think we've, we've, it, it's a little bit too stuffy. You know, mm -hmm. we, we um, I would love it if that could be redefined. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's, yes, we should respect the music and respect the people that have paid to come and listen to the music, but at the same time, it's not brain surgery. We're just, you know, trying to, communicate to human beings and if it's and if for whatever reason we've already created a 
you know, an already contrived thing out in the audience, how is it that we're going to be able to reach those people? Clap whenever you want to clap. I actually program uh, recitals so that people don't know where to clap, <laughs> so that they clap spontaneously. <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, or, you know, doing operas that have traditionally been in a different language, you do them in English, to an English-speaking audience, and all of a sudden people are like clapping in weird spots or laughing in weird spots. As soon as you like change, I, we were, you know, the first time the Met did, you know, the, the, the magic flute with a translation in, um, uh, into English. I had been talking to, before, before we did it, I was, you know, doing it in German and I was talking to Jim Levine, Jimmy Levine, who's, everybody knows. And, and he said, you know, this one part would be great if you did this in an Austrian accent. I'm like, I don't think anybody will get it. And um, then we decided, well, maybe I'll try to do it in an American accent, but it's a little bit too like German. Mm -hmm. So I said, what if I just say it in English? Because mm -hmm. we're going to do English later. And he's like, all right, cool. And, he, and then you can say, shh, Papageno, you know, you know, be, you know, switch back or whatever, go back to German. Or he, he scolded me. And the, the audience's re response at the Met when I switched into English after singing in German all night, it was just like, they got it. And to see that immediate was, it reinforced something that I had been thinking for a long time, which is, I, break down the barriers. If you want to communicate to people, you got to break down the barriers. And, is this perhaps the moment where this music that's been written hundreds of years ago and the act of performing it goes from being a recreative process to, in fact, a creative process yeah. in the moment. Absolutely. Is that something you aspire to? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be a curator of anything. I'm, <laughs> I want to actually be a creator of things. And How important is new music to you? Very. I, you know, the people that were singing Verdi's, you know, o o Otello the first time were singing new music, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm definitely on that bandwagon, and I think that um, you know, we went through a, a period of time where I think um, we, we've left the period of time where some composers had sort of a contempt for the audience. Hmm. Now, it, it's not that way. Composers and librettists are um, writing for the audiences. And it excites me. I do a lot of new music and a lot of new song and a lot of new operas. and. And, of course, the American Repertoire Council at Opera Philadelphia that I run, it's all about figuring out how to convince the public and also convince our art form that we need to, if we're going to survive, say something that an audience needs, you know? It, it's, it's, it, it has to be a cathartic experience. The Marriage of Figaro, for example, can be. You know, it's it's about revolution. You know, it's a revolution. It's about uh, all sorts of human experiences that people deal with all the time. But if you don't present it in a way that people get, then it's going to be just boring Italian Mozart opera, <laughs> rather than genius work that tell that moves you along in your life. I also think that we need to, you know, when it comes to new pieces, you know, the, these. Uh, whether it's an oratorio or, or, or an uh, um, orchestrated song or, a, or just a song cycle or an opera, it needs to be something that people can relate to today. You've always prepared such a diverse um, variety of roles in any given season. How do you deal with the pressure of time deadlines <laughs> when it takes uh, plenty of time to yeah. make a role believable. I have one of those personalities that actually really likes to show up knowing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, some of that stuff you just have to, the deadline thing or the debut thing or the, you know, the world premiere stuff and the HD broadcast, mm -hmm. and I just kind of, I put it in a box and let the nerves stew over there and I just don't deal with it. I deal with, I'm very much a, you know, focus on the small. If you mm -hmm. want to get, deal with the details, deal with the character, do your job and let the other stuff handle itself. What's the role 
of solitude in your artistic process? You know, when you're in my job, you're alone a lot. I mean, you travel a, a great deal away from home. Last year I was, I was home maybe well, less than two months, which was too much actually. It was, it was just, it got out of control. Um, you have to get, I don't know, you get used to it. You, you know, there's this, this kind of job is one where you're either really on or you're completely off. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff in between has to do with, you know, that I'm, and this is the part of life that I'm in right now, is um, fundraising. You, you really need to convince people that, you, you know, that, that are not involved in the arts but love them, love the arts, that um, it's great that you made boxes your whole life and you've got a ton of money from making boxes. But instead of just making boxes, why don't you make something beautiful with the money you earn from boxes, you know? You just take, take that and turn it into art. And uh, getting back to like the Greeks, we know a lot about the Athenians. We don't know a lot about the Spartans. Why? Because they spent no time on the arts, right? They were about war and, and war for the most part. But the Athenians, they're about art. And everything we have that we know about that culture is from that. And I think everything that we are about, if we spend all our time thinking about how to make money, you know, or how to get a bigger house, or how to, you know, get a better car, or how to, you know, whatever, is just, no, it will dissipate. But if you, if you think about our culture, if you spend your time thinking, you know, about and and enhancing and creating you know art whether it's a performing art or a, or or a painting or a sculpture or dance or whatever it might be you know, um that's what will be remembered it's always what's remembered you know it's like it's that's what we know about a, how do we know about ancient civilizations <laughs> through their art always mm -hmm. and um and so, at this point in my life, I, I'm not embarrassed to, uh, you know, get people to support that. <laughs> were there any people who helped you along the way? There were, there were times when my parents were helping me out, um, just, you know, well, you know, paying the rent or something in, <laughs> in New York or whatever when I was just starting out. or. Or all of a sudden you get some crazy tax bill and you're like, how in the world can I, you know, afford that? And they helped me. Um, there are, of course, a lot of competitions that I won that, mm -hmm. that, that helped in that regard. Um, I, but I know that there are, I, I definitely know that there are sponsors, people who find artists who they love and mm -hmm. sponsor them. Mm -hmm. And it's so important. I mean, you could be the next... In my, let's talk about singers, great singer, right? Yes. And you're, you know, 30 years old, and everybody knows you're the next great singer. But you still need financial support from patrons mm -hmm. and to, for another almost, you know, five, 10 years because it takes that long to actually be able to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a really tough job. You know, it's a, really tough job and and on top of it you know if people think about it there's you have statistically you have a much better chance of being a professional baseball player than a <laughs> self-sustained pro professional opera singer i mean there there are like 10 of us you know but but baseball they have hundreds you know it's just the, the stats are ridiculous and the competition's huge now that the you know the eastern bloc has opened up and we have singers coming from china and korea it's, it's incredibly competitive. Are there too many musicians in the world? No, never could be. And on top of that, I think people, I think, you know, I tell my students that, but you know, this, this particular thing, perform where you make the best art. Hmm. Sometimes it might be in your church choir. Great, so that's where you belong. Sometimes it might be with the Springfield Symphony. 
Great, that's where you should be. Sometimes it's the New York Philharmonic. Sometimes it's at the Met, sometimes it's somewhere else. But wherever you do your best work, that's where you belong, and that's where you should be. And it's not, your goal should not be, in the end, to sing at the Met. It seems like in the world of music today, there's, there's a pressure to succeed as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. But it seems like singers, more than any other musicians, understand the virtue of patience by nature of the fact that their instruments don't typically reach maturity until mid-30s. Yeah, mid-30s for men, definitely. When did you feel like your voice reached its fullest capacity? Or is it still growing? I don't know. I think it's. I think it, it, it changes all the time. I think mm -hmm. about it constantly because, you know, you um, as your bones harden, you get louder because it resonates more, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a harder surface, so the sound bangs off it a little bit more. Um, I, I go by the uh, philosophy that, you know, what grows slowly grows well, and then, you know, and um, I really don't know where I'm going to end up, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have so many, you know, when it comes to singing, um, I think I, I, when it comes to the established classical pieces, mm -hmm. I sort of know what I won't perform, but I get to kind of push myself to perform, but I don't want to because I like listening to it rather than thinking about how I would do it. Um, but I'm so involved in new pieces and new uh, works that uh, I can kind of redefine. Yeah, I, could, I, I have my own definition of growth, I guess. I just, I, I, I go by characters for the most part. And if I'm doing new pieces, they, they're sculpted towards, for me. How do you decide when you're vocally and experientially ready to take on a role? It's a tough, actually, it's, it's harder than it seems because uh, in the world of opera, you plan your, um, your schedule sort of is planned out about four years in advance hmm. or sometimes even more. So someone says, okay, Nathan, Billy Budd for the first time. We want you to sing a new production of Billy Budd at Lyric Opera Chicago. Do you want it? Hmm. But I know at the time when I said yes, I don't think I can do it. But I think in th three years, I can. So there's a little bit of a, you know, you counsel with your, the, you have a small group of people. I talked to Julie about it, my wife, who's you know, my coach and everything else. Hmm. I talked to my manager about it. I talk to, you know, trusted colleagues, you know, or friends who know and, and three or four people and say, what do you think? And then in the end, you say, is this to yourself, is this something that I can do? And um, a little, you know, a bit of it is, is guesswork. Um, but... And you know, it also includes knowing yourself. You know, how, am, am I going to be able to pull this off or not? So, uh, I don't know how to answer the question. I guess I, I, I you, you, you just try. You know, you give it your best shot. You try, and if it doesn't work out, have the uh, courage to say uh, before you show up six months before. You say, you know, this is just not right. You need to find somebody else. I've luckily never had that experience, but it has happened. What is good music? Oh, that's an interesting question. Good music, for me, if we're talking about songs, is the perfect wedding of text and sound. You know, so that the words and the music underneath, the words and the sound are so united that you can't seem to take them apart. Hmm. It's like they've always been together. It's like they came out of the earth. I think also any music can be as good as it is and as perfect as it is. If it's executed poorly, bad. You know, I've, 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 had, I've done a lot of new pieces and many composers who have said to me, you know, they come up and they're like, that's not what I was imagining in my head but what you did was a lot better, you know? Hmm. I had a, a, a teacher here who was, I thought it was, per I love this. He says, you know, to me, you know, why would you listen to the recording of Barber and, uh, and Leontine Price doing the Hermit mm -hmm. songs? Mm -hmm. 
He just wrote it. He doesn't know how it goes, right? That's what my job is. What I do is I, I, take, the, I take what is these weird little notes on a piece of paper. I mean, these things that don't re really represent accurately what it is we're doing, these dots all over the place with these words that we, you know, there are these markings on some thing, and I turn it into something that's living and breathing that has a, a beginning and an end. It's like a, a meal. I turn it into a meal that people can either enjoy or not, and then it's done. It's gone. You know, it's, you know even a recording. Uh, recordings are, are not... Unless it's you know composed you know specifically for it, they're a shadow of what it is we do. They're they're a they're a, a, a memoir. It's not the art, you know. And what I do is live. It's it's meant to be experienced then. And good music is a complete commitment to what you're doing without any barriers that, that the barrier thing is a big thing for me without any barriers between you and the people you're communicating to without any kind of uh, self-doubt or or um, you know contrived uh, uh, nuances or worry about doing the right style which drives me bananas you know it's it's about communicating a thought in the most clear way to the people that you're talking to. And the music is there, the sounds, the tunes, and the stuff underneath is there to make it as clear as possible. And that's what I'm there to do. And if I don't achieve that, then I think, always, I think I failed. So if good music depends on great execution, mm -hmm. how do we account for singers like Bob Dylan who didn't necessarily have a classically beautiful voice, yeah. but still were compelling performers? I think it's because of the honesty and another great, you know, um, I mean, there are a lot of great uh, uh, performers and singers who have really crappy voices, <laughs> uh, you know, or just really cannot, you know, don't know how to sing at all. But the thing that they do um, is communicate through their sound. Is you know, they they actually are are saying something rather than saying. You know, what you don't want to do is say, well, for example, you're playing the flute. I'm going to communicate, I'm playing the, or whatever it is, playing the flute. <laughs> I don't even know, that way or that way? I'm playing the flute or I'm playing the cello. No, you want to communicate what those sounds, you're trying to say something. Same thing in the words. Bob Dylan's a poet. I mean, you know, it's, he, he just, he's reciting poetry is what he's doing. And, and he means it and he believes it and, uh, and, uh, and that's why it affects us the way it does. When did you discover that you have a voice? Um, I would say I never really did, or I suppose I never actually have. People hire me to sing, and uh, I love to sing. And um, you know, part of the, the mystery about singing is that when you do it right, you don't hear what other people hear. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've ever listened to a recording of your own voice, you're like, "Is that really what I sound like?" Um, so, I love music and I love words. I particularly love words, and uh, and when they come together in such a way that inspires me and. Um, Like, for example, this setting where we're sitting together and we're talking to each other and you listen and I talk and I, I listen and you talk, that's a very civilized way of communicating. And it's, it's not like that in the world generally. Mostly it seems to be pretty chaotic. Mm -hmm. And I, it makes me feel good to be able to know what I'm going to say, go out on a stage and say it to a few thousand people who are all sitting in their chairs listening and not talking. I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's a very, but, um, and they hire me to do it. They, you know, so I, I, apparently people like what I sound like, but I, you know, I don't do it because I think I have a good voice. I do it because it's, because the music and the, and the words compel me to. It was the composer Franz Liszt who said that becoming a great musician is about becoming a great 
human being. Yeah. In terms of your development as a musician, how much of that rings true for you? All of it. For me, it's about, um, I mean, I don't know what being a great human being exactly is, but uh, I, I try to every day be as loving as I can, meaning charitable, um, compassionate, um, understanding. You know, there's, like for example, my, my daughter Jordan, who's a beautiful cellist, I'm very much in the, in, in this, in the um, category of you should go to a school of music rather than a conservatory because I feel like if you go to a school of music, you might be a better, more interesting person because you learn about other stuff besides music. But as a cellist, you sort of need to spend seven hours a day in the practice room, right? Mm -hmm. Or a pianist, same thing. You're just sure. in there banging away, and that offers that possibility. And I understand that, but I, you know, and but then once you've done all of that, you need to experience life. For me, I can't tell you. I mean, having five children and the craziness that's involved with that, with that, and uh, yeah, um, living in different parts of the world all the time, and and seeing how other people live, reading all the you know, not all the classics, but as many as I can. Um, Observing human nature, uh, that's part of the acting thing. My, you know, Julie, my wife, always talks about that, that I, she notices that I watch people a lot. Mm -hmm. I watch how they walk. Mm -hmm. I see certain personalities and I see how they talk or move or hand gesture because it's all part of my job. I'm trying to figure out, you know, when I, when I play a particular character, how to best, how to, how to distill it into the thing that is the most accurate right and um, I think none of that can be done if you are not um, what did let's say a good human being yes uh, like a real human being a human, mm -hmm. good human being you, you need to love people I mean otherwise none of otherwise none of it makes sense but then what happens with the fact that a lot of the baritone roles are these conniving villains yeah I know right yeah it's kind of funny well you know, you gotta like the villains too. They must have an issue <laughs> that you can understand, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. They are kind of conniving villains, but it's, but that makes them interesting, and um, it's kind of cathartic as well because you can let all that sort of pent up aggression out. So it doesn't take a long time to get into that role. Oh no, 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 no. I just think about you know, I, I could never sing it. It's not my voice type, but Claggart and Billy Budd. Oh my God, just like. The things he says, you know, you know. I don't know if you're already about wipe you off the face of the earth, oh. off this. Oh, it's just you know. First, I'll what do you say? First, I'll trouble your happiness. I'll mutilate and silence the body that you dwell. You'll hang from the yard. I mean, this sort of stuff is something that. You know, one of the best claggots I ever worked with was actually a Mennonite, a pacifist. Hmm. But boy, when he got into out there in Claggart, it let all that, he, 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 went, he let go of the pacifism and it was one of the scariest, uh, he was one of the scariest villains I've ever worked with. And it's good for, you know, everybody's got that in them. They just, but we let it out on the stage. Singers have such delicate instruments. Yeah. Do they face... A fear that's unusual that other instrumentalists would not know in terms of longevity, for example, or psychological? Um, well, when it comes to psychological, when somebody says, doesn't hire you because they don't like your voice, it's kind of like saying, I don't want to hire you because I don't think you're pretty enough. You know what I mean? It's 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 hard, you know. Somebody, you know, it, it's a very personal thing. I was talking to Plaza Domingo about this, you know, because he conducts and stuff, mm -hmm. and he's like, well, you know, conducting is easy because your back's facing the audience. Singing is really hard. You're facing the audience, and it's your instrument is you. It is literally you. It's your body resonating, and if and some people don't like it, and that's a pretty tough thing to take. Uh, so it's very personal. Um, are you ever worried that your audiences um, are there for the wrong reasons or appreciate 
something based on image rather than the content of the music that you've poured yourself into? No, I just want them in the seats. I think, you know, if I can get them there, great. Mm -hmm. Whatever reason, I don't care. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I, I really just have a, I have a very strong desire to get people to come to the theater. You know, I read the, and I completely disagree with him, but I, I was in uh, uh, Kleinborn one summer, hmm. all summer. Yeah, I mean, it was, didn't seem like summer, but it was, and I picked up a, the Confessions of St. Augustine, and I was reading this chapter where he was talking about how he was against theater because he thought that it created such a cathartic experience that people wouldn't do what they're supposed to do, you know? They're like, you know, oh, wow, Mimi's dead, now I feel better because I don't have to deal with people with tuberculosis anymore. And I actually totally disagree with that. I think that the more people that come to the theater and can experience this communal thing where we all as human beings uh, acknowledge particular um, human experiences that are distilled in such a way that you can receive it in like an, uh, two and a half hours or three hours is a very good thing. I think it should be really sad that Mimi dies of tuberculosis at the end and, and that the friends don't know what to do and they sold all their stuff and, and you know, Rodolfo is like distraught. I think that's great. I think it's actually helpful. I think it teaches a lesson. Um, In going through those times before one finds an established career, Beyond the people who support you financially, mm -hmm. are there people who helped support you in your vision, who carried you through from the time that you didn't necessarily think that things would work out until the time that you did succeed? My parents were very big in that. They, they, I know they had, they thought, oh my gosh, what's going on with him? Yeah, yeah my great grandfather was chief justice of the Supreme Court here in Illinois. <laughs> my grandfather was a, a lawyer and a, a businessman real estate guy in Illinois. My dad ended up, you know, was an uh, industrial designer and uh, I ended up being a singer and I'm just thinking, what's worse, a poet? I mean, what am I going to produce, right? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so, um, but they were always, I mean, I could tell they were a little bit worried, you know, I got married young and I'm a singer and what in the world is he going to do for a living? Mm -hmm. But um, they were always, you know, they're always like, you can do this. Um, Julie, my wife, you know, she, she never had any doubt that I would be successful in whatever I, you know, whatever avenue I ended up going in. And I met her when I was not singing well. I mean, she, you know, she helped me through so much, you know, she was there from the, you know, boy you suck to boy you're, you know, you're a famous opera singer now. Mm -hmm. And, um, so she was absolutely always there. Uh, is success based on character? Is character destiny? Interesting question. I would say yes. Um, success is, well, how you define it, first of all. And uh, I think a person with, as you say, character somebody who is able to hold his head up high and because he's done the work that he knows he should have done, you know, that's the thing. If you do the work, if you put the hours in and you are honest about it and you're honest with yourself, like I said, you end up where you're supposed to be. And if you end up where you're supposed to be, where you're making the best, having the greatest effect on on humanity mm -hmm. you are successful I, what i don't think is success means a billion dollars a million dollars or whatever it might be that you think of as success i don't think it means you people know your name i don't think it means any of that the, to me that is not success success is ending up where you're supposed to be doing the work that you're supposed to do and affecting the world the way you're supposed to and as soon as you start pulling yourself back from that that's why i have my finger in so many pies right now you know if the, I know that there are things that need to be done and I know that I can kind of help facilitate that and so I'm involved in it not everything I mean there are a lot of things I'm not involved in at all but there are certain things that 
I am. And if I withdraw and just kind of go, whatever, I'm just going to sing three operas a year and do a couple of recitals and hang out and barbecue. To me, that's not success. That's just laziness. <laughs> you know, so um, at the moment, I would say that uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, you know. The, I tell my students, I'm like, uh, and maybe this is what character is. I'm not, I'm trying to do the best work I can, but all I'm doing is sustaining it for you. I want you all to be, I want to give you something to, you know, to move into and to be better at and to take somewhere else. But, you know, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not particularly the, the generation that's going to change stuff. I am now trying to create a situation where you all can succeed. Hmm. And then, which, which, and that's ironic because once they get to where I am, they'll be doing the exact same thing. So success is, in, in, in my opinion, actually creating a situation where your, your, the people that are coming up behind you, not necessarily your, you know, the younger generations have something. Success is being able to offer something that's sustainable and good rather than, you know, like taking stuff and being famous in your own right. I don't think of it as like that at all. It's sort of a, here it is, and I'm holding it for you until you can hold it, and then I'll go away. That's kind of my view of all of this. Because, well, yeah. What's the single most important thing, any concept that you try to impart with your students? You, you, you really cannot make progress if you're not okay with yourself. Mm. You've got to be, when you sing, like I said, you are your instrument. And you can't make progress until you allow yourself to sound like you. Some people, most people, are frightened of that. They want to do all sorts of weird things, you know. It's, it's much why, you know, it's the same thing as, you know, makeup, you know, or, or armor or what we do physically with, you know, clothing and all of that. Mm -hmm. But when you sing, you're naked, you know. And until you can actually make a naked sound, which takes a lot of courage, you can't progress from there. And I think that, psych that has a very strong psychological effect on them. And I think hopefully they take it through their lives and say, this is who I am, this is what I do. And you know what? I know, and this is the thing I emphasize as well, and I tell them, not everybody's gonna need it. Not just accept it, but not everybody needs what you have to offer, and that's okay. You know, maybe 70% of them will, and that's a hell of a lot better than politicians. They get like <laughs> way less, you know, of a percentage. They're lucky if they get 50, you know. So, you know, uh, um, I think that's it, you know. Do you ever sing for yourself? Do you sing in the shower? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Not so much. It's funny because, you know, you know our life is spent um, here in, with music. We you know, there's so much involved, and, and uh, everybody's in, uh, there's music all the time. But when we're home, you often, almost never hear, you know, a radio playing or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's just, silence is like music for me, because it's just nonstop. <laughs> Every once in a while, you know, I, we had a friend over the other night, and I was trying to explain to her that she had to see the Eugene Onegin movie with Ray Fiennes and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Tyler, and, uh, and that this opera is fantastic, you know, they don't have the music from, so I played her some, uh, um, some Tchaikovsky and while we were sitting there and I thought, you know, it's kind of hard to have a conversation when there's so much music playing. I can't focus on you when I have that playing because it takes my, it is so distracting, so I, I shut it off. So we rarely have any of that, unless it's live. I mean, Jordan might be playing the cello or something like that, or Julie <laughs> might be playing the piano, or Madeline might be playing the piano, or whatever. But yeah, um, that's different. But but actually, recordings, yeah, we always, yeah, we, we uh, <laughs> you, you won't hear it in this house. <laughs> it's weird. What's next in the world of Nathan Gunn? You've taken on so many different roles. Yeah. Would you ever consider directing opera? Thought about it. 
I've thought about it. Julie seems to think I would be really good at it. I've done some scenes. Um, I'm not there quite yet, but hmm. not not because I don't. Because when I when I'm in it and I'm able to, I get yeah, I have lots of good ideas and it's very specific specific ideas about what to do. It's just I'm not quite at the point in my life where I could get excited without the performers there and plan for it, as I do with other things. You know, with um, you know the American Repertory Council in Upper Philadelphia, I think a lot about how to make that work and how to make that really change the world of opera and I think about it when I'm not there. I think about the, the roles that I'm preparing and the, and the different songs that I'm doing. I think about uh, you know Lyric Theater at Illinois, this, I'm general director of that now and, and how we're going to plan these schedules and who, how it's going to be funded and who's going to do it and what kind of cool like you know themes we can have. I'm like thinking about a revolutionary theme at one point with all women you know, stuff. It's just, and that jazz is, you know, I get really cool, you know, like jazzed about that, but um, yeah, I just haven't gotten there yet with directing. It's, uh, I, I, I don't, there are a lot of really great directors and I don't want to, I don't categorize, I, I don't put myself in that position. Will we hear a Don Giovanni from Nathan Gunn? I would love to do Giovanni. I was actually talking to my agent about that. There's a Giovanni coming up in Aix-en-Provence, I think, in a couple of uh, two or three years, and I thought maybe I'll, maybe it's time to, maybe it's time to visit that. But I would love to do that again. Um, the fun thing is, is that the the roles that I find most exciting are the ones that I get to create. I've been fortunate enough to be able to create a lot of roles with new pieces, and. Uh, Inman in Cold Mountain that's coming up in Santa Fe next year. Yes. I can't wait to do that. That is the American Ulysses. That's, that's the story, right? Cold Mountain. And um, Ulysses is another actual role I'd love to do. But, <laughs> but um, he, that, yeah, so I've, I, it's the thing that the roles that excite me the most right now are the ones that actually probably haven't been written yet. Thank you so much for what you do musically and what you share humanly. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure having you on Living the Classical Life. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Absolutely.